Uh, so thanks everybody for uh, for joining us this morning on the chat with Matt. I I was joking with Grace. I'm a little rusty on these. Actually, hadn't done uh, done a webinar in two to three months or so. Had a cancellation and just uh, scheduling. I've been traveling all over the country and 18 cities this year. So just trying to keep up with all this good stuff. But glad to have um, Grace join me this morning. Grace and I have known each other. I'm not sure how long Grace coming up on a couple of years. Maybe we yeah, met. Yeah, a little, a little over. Yeah, a little more than that. Maybe about early on in my in my journey. Okay, awesome. <laughs> which yeah. my journey now is actually ten years, which is weird. Oh wow! Oh wow! Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So awesome, and and um, and we've become friends and colleagues, and um, I think both have the same passion in terms of free market healthcare, and and so I think it's going to be a fun discussion today. I've got some notes here for Grace's interview. Uh, just in terms or introduction, rather, in terms of just who Grace is, and she can fill in the gaps. And certainly, it's far more than my few notes. But just to give you an idea, right? And so we can we can start there. But uh, Grace, as I know Grace, in the in the very brief form of of her introduction, is a physician and surgeon, and now author. And so that's awesome. So we're fellow authors, as mm -hmm. either we're authors uh, several years ago, right? But we saw a need and we saw a gap and we filled it. And it's a great way to educate. Uh, I have down Pensacola. Is that still? That's correct. Uh huh. Awesome. And Panhandle, so, Florida. Yeah, Panhandle. I had a friend who moved down there and got some family down there. And uh, uh, the title of Grace's book is called Private Practice Solution. And so I have read it uh, cover to cover, not skimmed it, but read it. And it's an excellent book. And uh, I would say it's a great how to book for uh, any physician coming out of school, residency, or coming out of a mature practice or a seasoned veteran, if you will, physician who wants to start a practice. And it really gives you the, the down to earth kind of explanation of how to do everything from the billing and, and setting up the office and just A to Z in terms of how to do that. And I thought it was really well written and really clearly understandable, especially for a non-medical person uh, like me. Uh, so. And then I just lastly, I have down uh, for as Grace is a, a vocal advocate for physician autonomy, which I think ties uh, with patient autonomy as well, right? Exactly. That together, but especially physician autonomy in that we know that that's been, um, physician autonomy has been shrinking uh, this trend. I'm not sure, you know, I would say something like 20, 30, 40 years mm -hmm. Um, where it used to be very different in the old days, if you will, the house visits and um, and even bartering and, you know, way, way back, I'll give you some cucumbers and tomatoes if you could just give me a checkup, you know, people, that was normal back then. Right. But the, this right. relationship, this relationship oriented care that was a win-win, that wasn't, that was affordable, it wasn't, um, it, it didn't, didn't run you over like a truck when you needed care. And that's all transitioned to uh, hospitals, as uh, many would say, owning the doctors. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like that word if I were a physician. Uh, and controlling and all the things that go with it. So, and then which which affects their ability to do the care that they were well trained to do in school. So, Grace, uh, there's my there's my intro for you. Oh, I uh, thank you. Very very gracious thing, uh, <laughs> intro there. By the way, um, for those who don't know my area um, of of specialty, I'm, I'm I'm a podiatrist, so I do see patients um, as a surgeon. Also, I, I practice on the Gulf Coast and have been practicing here for about 25 years. And um, Pensacola is home to the Blue Angels. We just had our wonderful show, homecoming show last week, uh, which was fantastic. And um, this area, they're they're very dynamic um, in the sense that uh, they're they're very innovative with things. However, because I live in Florida. Um, one of the things that we we deal with uh, on a day to day um, in our patient base is that I'm dealing with a lot of managed care because we have geriatrics. Um, uh, the three two five zip code has one of the highest um, senior populations, but also the highest uh, military retiree uh, populations. So for me to go out in a direct care uh, practice um, against that, that was actually one of the fear factors that I went through um, as I lecture and talk to coach and um, have written about in the private practice solution. I, the, the key thing here is this whole free market 
ecosystem that we're trying to revert back to because this is not new medicine this is old way of doing healthcare like you alluded to it's a very traditional way of doing things working one on one because for the most part um doctors went into a practice to help people and it was always based on the one on one relationship with the doctor um and the patient uh but when third parties got uh in intertwined in that. The insurance uh, began to take over a little bit more of the decision-making and the business end of the, the practice. It was no longer just a, a relationship thing. It was a transaction thing that was happening with, with medicine. Um, it changed. Medicine grew around the doctors as far as business is concerned, and it, it separated the doctor from the patient. So my shtick, so to speak, is really always trying to work towards having doctors remember why we went into medicine. Um, the value is in the skills that we have and the knowledge that we have to share with, with others. Um, and it's, it's very community-based. Uh, I'm very blessed. I've been in now direct care initially starting about 2013 at the time the Obama chair, uh, Obamacare changes were and ACA was coming into fruition, a lot more quality measures, which had nothing to do with medicine, but more for metrics. Um, that's what kind of pushed me over the edge to uh, get back into uh, looking at a different way of doing things. And also just financially as a private practice owner, which we remind physicians when you are the owner of a private practice, you are a small business. And there was no teaching of business in, in medical school. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of factors that were, that, that seem to be like little hurdles. Mm -hmm. um, and as we go on in, in this new way of, of talking with doctors, um, I'm encouraged. I was telling Matt right before we got on here, um, I was speaking to two groups just at a recent conference medical students and residents are so gung-ho because the concepts make sense to them. When we talk about free market uh, medicine principles, it's always about consumer choice. It's always about transparency in the price. And it's always about um, the quality that you're getting. And it's based on the quality that's rendered. Um, and, and I think established patients, uh, established doctors understand that too, but they're more fearful because they've seen the change happen. So I guess one of the things that I'm always reaching out to you, Matt, and to all the benefits folks. It's like, how do we merge this? Because we have the know-how, but you guys have the patients. <laughs> so, you know, you're dealing with the employers that have to be able to, to convert into our offices. Um, personally, myself, I offer DPC plans for my staff. So, you know, it has to start also from the employer perspective as well as from the doctor's perspective. Yeah, you know, great. Um... I mean, I think your your wealth of your experience here firsthand is gonna is gonna be fascinating to discuss. I can tell you my my perspective uh, again non medical. So uh, really, in, in in fact, my perspective is even especially unique in that I was an employer, right? I'm not mm -hmm. I'm not a broker. I'm not an advisor. Today we have a health plan, right? Um, but I have the employer lens, so the buyer seller, if you will, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So I attend. So I'm speaking at these conferences all over, and and some of these are DPC, if you will, maybe blending DSC as well, direct specialty care. Mm -hmm. Do need to work together. In fact, DPC is probably the biggest refer, right? Especially in the future to DSC. But as I'm sitting in these rooms, I'm sitting in Orlando. I think you were in Orlando, weren't you? Is mm -hmm. that right? Mm -hmm. And so there's around 300, mostly DPC, but medical right physicians. Right. And then uh, Dallas. Were you at Dallas? No, the, I was, I was, I was getting, I was up in New York getting the book oh, award. You're getting your award, yeah. Uh, so I'd like to hear about that as well. But I'm so now, now I'm sitting in a room with like 600 doctors. I mean, right. I'm culture change guy. I observe cultures quickly, analyze them. Some I'm observe, just observing, right? As an, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not like one of them, the majority, but I'm observing every doctor I speak to, every doctor that jumps on stage is articulate and bright. I mean, there's a, there's an interesting screening that's happened here. Because if, in order to be an MD or a DO or, you know, to become a doctor, you have to be really bright. You have to be really determined and focused and so forth. And so there's like a, this is like a, a level here of folks that is certainly above average, if you will, in terms of speaking and understanding and learning and so forth. 
And so I'm watching this, but then, as you mentioned, I've heard, you know, uh, they don't teach now, maybe medical schools because it's supposed to be focused on medical school that, that there's, there's, there's just there, no time. I mean, I'm curious, you know, so like, I'm curious, but were there any even offerings or should that, have, should that be on the side? But it certainly, there seems to be a, a collaborative effort here to almost keep doctors and I don't know how you want to phrase it, but prevent doctors from even thinking about those things. And of course, our movement is teaching otherwise, but Benjamin Rush Institute, we're now in FMMA, come for free. We're inviting to our conference, Don't Feed the Beast Conference in Milwaukee, uh, medical students come for free. So I just would like your thoughts on that, Grace, in terms of just some of the things I shared and that unique perspective. But we're talking about a lot of capable folks here. And I'll finish with this to kind of segue in terms of your thoughts. But you mentioned Fear Factor. So I used to watch the show Fear Factor with Joe Rogan. Anybody yeah. watch that? Put you like in this cage with spiders and stuff. Right. You can Crawling. endure it. <laughs> uh, but there's, there is a lot of fear, right? There's a lot of fear in terms of going on. And so... Uh, what are your thoughts on those things in terms of uh, doctors, either new doctors or or seasoned doctors going into independent practice? I, and I think you hit it right on, you, you hit the nail on the head. Um, for established practices, understanding where the, the way that medical school functions, um, it's, I, I, I uh, uh, being in a military town, um, it's very much like going to Paris Island in the sense that you go there, they break you down and they build you back up again, you know? Um, and what they've done, there's a great phrase by Dr. Arlen Matt Myers, which I quote in, book, in the book, we are, con we are conditioned to conform because it is a see one, do one apprenticeship, see one, do one, teach one apprenticeship way of teaching. So hmm. All of those that were ahead of you and a huge change that has occurred just in my 25 years of since residency, um, when I was a resident, almost a third, a little bit more than that, of my residency training was outpatient care and in clinics as far as with private practices. So, um, you know, we, we covered the hospital. We had trauma cases there. We uh, also had a, an outpatient clinic that we were responsible for. That was kind of a norm back then. Um, today, and, and this is where the insidious um, connections with some of the more corporate things and, 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 and insurance plans and, and government plans also, understanding that Medicare is the main source of um, revenue and funding for residency programs. The majority of students today don't have outpatient clinic as often. Um, and uh, so there's a huge change when I would sit and do small table discussions with residents 20 years ago. What are you going to do after you finish medicine or finish your residency? Well, I'm going to hang a shingle. I'm going to open up a practice. I'm going to join a, another doctor, same specialty or in a multi-group specialty and go there. That is huge change now. The Merritt Hawkins does last year resident um, interviews and surveys. The 2023 one shows that the majority, almost a hundred uh, call outs to, from employer groups like corporate hospital groups are coming to, to last year residents. They are being inundated to be hired on as employees. And I think a lot of it has to do with the debt because they don't know how to pay for their, their student debt. Um, so that, that in the background is what I think has changed a lot of the ways that people are thinking about it. Um, my take on that is if we can plant seeds through Benjamin Rush, through FMMA, through my book, through us talking and introduce it at a younger age, like I said, these residents and medical students get it. They see the, the value of doing that and they don't want to fall into that trap. The hard part is with our seasoned doctors that are experienced. If you have someone that's, you know, not risk averse, they will plan it through. And that's, that's a hard, that's a hard uh, switch up, but um, it's doable because you do this and uh, you do this every day when you're teaching or treating a patient. 
the way that I teach doctors to break away and get into a direct care mindset is I tell them your practice is your most important patient. Treat it like that. And if you know how to analyze, you look at data and then figure out a plan out of it, that is this classic soap note that we work on on every patient. So if you think of your patient as uh, as the practice and make that your important thing, it then begins to make sense. But you have to switch your mind into thinking it. It's not really business. It's not really a, um, a going to be much different than the way that we that we do things already. We have the skill set. We just have to put it in a different context. So um, I'm very hopeful because what we're doing now, and I think even medical schools are changing. I, I um, adjunct teach at, at uh, Florida State down here. Um, and one of the unique things with their third and fourth year programs, which is wonderful, they're community-based. Um, so their rotations, a lot of them are in private practices. So they're getting introduced again back to it. So everything comes full circle. I think we're just in that exciting time right now where we're converting over. Unfortunately, in the midst of it, we've got established doctors who are burning out, who are leaving practice. And the key thing here is we need to continue attracting good people into this profession. Um, so. There are, yeah, there are several pieces at play here. I mean, one is that the way doctors are treated or controlled and not given that autonomy, they're very frustrated. So they're having these thoughts. And then on the, on the buyer side, uh, one of the things I've noticed, and it's interesting, you know, 25 years or so, right? This is only, tw they say 20-ish tw years as a generation. Mm -hmm. so it's interesting how sometimes things are transformed across generations, because if you grow up in today's world, you'd say, this is the way it is. This is, mm -hmm. you would make an assumption, probably this is the way it's always been. Right. But just a little more, even say one generation ago, it was very normal to have a majority of, say, independent outpatient practices where one of the th one of the thing uh, curious wonders I've had is that do that do the hospitals become inpatient centers and it almost I, as you said that I kind of got the impression that maybe that's kind of what they were in the past more of the high level stuff ICU ER inpatient that and it didn't used to be like that and now we're seeing this trend come the other way and mm -hmm. thoughts on that yeah no you know I think it comes down to putting it in perspective and this is. One of the things also that I always want to do is not just talk from a physician's perspective, just from a community perspective. Look at the way that health insurance is used. And when it began to cover routine services, the patient responsibility and accountability was taken away from the patient. The patient lost autonomy there because they're being told you need to go in for this checkup where they should have had the, the wherewithal to go in on themselves. Um, you know, we, I, the analogies I always use is, you know, imagine if car insurance paid for gas tires and, and oil changes, you know, that we, we don't use and, you know, free market uh, medicine association always talks about there's a difference between health insurance and health care. And again, I think we, we speak the same language when we're talking to people that we have to emphasize that to not just community and patients, but to doctors as well, because the, even doctors have thought, well, this is the way I need to treat it because the insurance company tells me I can't, I can't order this test on that day. Um, so it's become so skewed, uh, but I think we can, educating is the key thing. Communicating this out there is the key thing. I will tell you one of the neat things is that since I've been doing direct care and the way that works in my office, because I am not membership based, I'm a specialist. So it's episodic care, but it's treated like you go to a mechanic, like you go to um, a store, like you go, you know, what you, you're, or you work with a mechanic, you work with a, a carpenter, you work with an accountant, you work with an attorney. Um, it's, it's negotiated and it's agreed on um, at the time of the visit. There's no third party involved in that, but um What's, what's interesting about that is we give the patient an opportunity to say, okay, you have insurance. If you want to use it and try and, um, if you want to try and file towards self, when they go through that process themselves, they are my best advocates for direct care and for free market. And then when I start talking to patients and our communities and, and to doctors about how 
you can you have control over this. You don't have to have somebody else controlling it. Um, and explaining to them that, yeah, the insurance companies are there, but have they really been good stewards of your money? You know, uh, that's they've been touting for 40 years. There's a great chart and I actually have it in my uh, in my book um, from Citizen Health. It's the last 40 years and the healthcare administration line is going up. The physician line is completely flatlined. You know, you're talking about all this extraneous work in my own practice. You see that also when I was in insurance medicine, which I did for 15 years consistently, um, I had more staff. I have reduced the amount of overhead in my office. So from a business perspective that you can see how that financially works out um, uh, in small business, you know, when we start seeing that and we see that healthcare administration, who who's going to be treating people later on if doctors keep leaving because they can't keep up with it? You know, your your claims adjuster, your your healthcare administrator, you know, um, it, it, health, you know, administration is important, but there's no health care if you don't have doctors. Well, in a, in a free market, too, if a business becomes too heavy administratively, then they they suffer. They don't they suffer. Money, exactly. Or they're forced mm -hmm. to be efficient. And I think mm -hmm. we've seen in a, in a monopoly, right, which is really what's been created by the sellers. They, there's no they do whatever they want. They just right. create prices. Of course, now the buyers are kind of buckling. Their knees are buckling because they can't afford it. Anymore. Right. Right. Um, and so I think, you know, I, I um, as in my travels, I really uh, I get some interesting questions and really meeting a lot of great people. I was just in Idaho uh, for their inaugural FMMA event, and I didn't get her card. And I almost fear that I scared her a little bit. Um, but uh, this, you know, it's just one of those random conversations after you talk, very brief. So this ear, nose and throat doctor came up to me. And, and so maybe she'll see this and reach out to me or something or, or read your book, you know, I can put you two in, in connection, but she said, I'm getting ready to start my own practice. And do you have any advice for me or something? And I, I said, you know, the, the common question that I get, so in, is, is how to get patient, how do I get patients? Or, or there's an assumption by doctors that if you just build it, they will come, you put the practice in place and then they'll show up. And I think uh -huh. Most, uh, we've had very good success. In fact, I don't know of one single failure of DPC or DSC in Wisconsin, but that that is the challenge. I've seen them take six months to, uh, to 12 months to get started. Right. Anyway, so the way this works, the way this works in the free market model is we have direct primary care becomes our own funnel. That's how the hospitals use to collect patients. And they right. and, they seven, and their medical groups. Yeah, mm -hmm. medical groups. And we and they do seven minute care. And we and then, of course, DPC does 30, 60 minute uh -huh. chronic condition treatment, et cetera. But then what I'm seeing is the DSCs, and not everybody calls it that. I think it's the cleanest name, direct specialty care, folks right. like yourself, ear, nose, and throat. I'm seeing that their primary referral is DPC, right? Independence referring to independence for value shopping. And the plan, the health plan doesn't always align with that, but I'm curious. So you've been operating where you said 10, 10 years. 10 or years so. now, yeah. yeah. As a DSC, right. so what, what advice would you give and, and this could be for advisors, employers, and especially DSC docs that are either have broken off or looking at breaking off. How do you get patient flow? Well, it, again, it depends upon what stage you are in, in creating your practice. If you're transitioning, you already have a patient base. So mm -hmm. you're communicating with them. Um, if you're building, you go out and, and market yourself, you know, research your market and see what's needed and introduce yourself. If you don't put yourself out there, um, patients won't know what's going on and look for adjunct services. As a podiatrist, I went to, to um, daycare clinics to talk about children's foot health. I went to, um, I went to shoe stores and talk to the employees on how to fit and pick out shoes. You know, you have to find your niche with that. Uh, you you work your church, you work your your kids groups. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's regular marketing like that. But I think one of the things I'm going to go back to what I was saying. It's this condition to conform way of thinking. We've got this generation that has gotten used to having insurance cards, and insurance will pay for everything, and they were never introduced. And that seed wasn't planted when they were in school. So they immediately think that as a specialist, I need to have a referral for my for a patient to come to me. 
That is not the case. And I think in podiatry, one of the reasons why that that wasn't as difficult for me to, to get around um, was that Medicare didn't, uh, didn't require a um, referral to podiatry. Mm -hmm. um, so I always went into it already knowing that patients could actually go. The funny thing is that they were told by their primary doctor who didn't know the rule that you didn't need to do that. So it's just, again, it's re-educating them if I need to see a, um, if I have to build build something, if I have to have a pool built at the house, I'm not going to call the general contractor. I'm going to call the pool builder directly right. because that's what you do in the free market. So right. if I need to get an ingrown toenail taken care of, you know, okay, you can go to your primary doctor, but why don't you call the person that's actually going to do it, get right. rid of that middleman step. You're actually inundating your primary doctor with a little bit more, but, um, you know, in a, in a network and as you build a plan for a community, having the DPC doctors as a funnel is wonderful. You, that, that does work um, because they have the, the greater, um, they have the greater funnel that they're getting uh, people into, but patients should realize that they can go out and reach us individually also. So uh, it's re-educating. Right. Yeah. I think there's so many ways we've been conditioned in this this path, right? And I, I tend to think out of the box, but I think, and I've just always been wired by that, but I think right. we're all, we're all naturally wired to conform, as you mentioned. And so this notion, even that HMOs kind of created some of that and this perception that you have to have a referral. And, and so when, when to know and when not, when not to know, one of the, one of the things I run into, so uh, DPCs, for instance, now they can just be paid by the, by the employers. They can have Farmers come in, construction companies just write them a check out of their accounting department. Even large employers can right. add on DPC and pay all or part of it. So uh, that's and that doesn't isn't highly, I would say, uh, is a great first step. Here's Matt's opinion, uh, but is not highly disruptive. To mm -hmm. one, it's not changing the market at all. It's giving better care for employees, employees, but it's adding cost. In some cases, replacing costs, but depending on how many are using it, if 10 right. percent, 20 percent are using it, but you're paying for 100 percent, you've added cost. Right, right. Um, but here's where I'm going yeah. with this. Um, have in, uh, and I'll uh, shift it to you. So how? But but then when you talk about DSCs, so employers, if you're using DF, DPCs or advisors, but you're referring everything back to the hospital, you're not gaining that much. You're gaining better care and a little bit of cost but you're still referring, referring all the expensive care and, and there could even be exceptions at specialists. Mm -hmm. But what they tend to run into, I think, is when the DPC is there and they say, okay, who's in network, right? So maybe they've been added, but what about your network? Maybe you're on a marketplace plan or I don't know if you accept insurance. Have you ran into that to say people come to you and let's say it's more than say a small fee, but like it's a surgery or something and they say, mm -hmm. well, you're out of network. Have you ran into that? So again, a conditioned thing, patients have the options to use their insurance or not. And I think a lot of people forget, they think that because I have this insurance, my husband has this plan, I have to use this hospital because the insurance says so. I, I kind of break that in entirely. So if I'm doing surgery on a patient, perfect case, I had one this week. Um, so this lady has a plan through her husband and she, I give them both options. So yeah. for surgery, what many people don't realize is the breakdown of how things are paid. There's a surgeon's fee, there's an anesthesia and a facility fee. And mm -hmm. I keep my privileges at the hospital. I also have negotiated rates with, um, outpatient surgery centers and ENTs do this, plastic surgeons do this, um, you're, you're, you again, educate your patient to number one, it is their choice to use their insurance or not. I'm not on any insurance. So I've opted out of Medicare. So I have private contracts with my Medicare patients. Um, mm -hmm. And that's not my rule. That's Medicare's rule. You know, that's, uh, that's what's funny. I, and I tell my patients that and I go, this is a government uh, uh, requirement that I need to, to, tell you that you are choosing to see a doctor that is not in your network. Because when you read the actual thing, you're realizing this, it's almost redundant to have that, but I get what they, they're doing. I'm just going to, I will comply with that. And um, 
you know, but when you tell a patient, it's like, no, you don't, you don't have to use your insurance if you don't want to, but they think because they have the card, they have to use their insurance, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, but trying to break through that again, educating them about mm -hmm. that when it comes to out, like outpatient or higher end procedures. So I will, will tell them, ask the cash price. We'll start with like something like an MRI. I will tell them, tell them that you have insurance, but ask them what the cash price is and then have them run it through insurance if they have mm -hmm. one of the buco plans or something like that i fell into that as a patient because my my mris on my children who played winter sports in december and got injured we never met our deductible when we were still on those plans and so i found out that i was paying more for my co-insurance than i was for a cash price over there but patients don't know that so ed again educate them about that when it comes to surgeries you can break down the uh, the the delineate basically all of the the line items, and so for this particular patient, she wanted to do it uh, in an, a hospital setting. She had met almost her deductible on her insurance, so her facility and anesthesia were covered. But I gave them a cash price for my surgeon's fee. Um, you you make it work with them one on one. Keep in mind also these practices, the direct specialty care practices are not going to be inundated with the number of patients that we are we're used to. I'm, I'm, I go from what I used to see almost 26 to 30 patients a day down to a busy day for me is going to be about 10, you know, so I, I major, major difference with that. So you have the time to talk with your patient about this. <laughs> I knew that. I'm going to, I want to segue to that. I, um, I knew that was the case for DPC, but not DSC. One, one comment about, it's interesting, the, the tricks the industry has played, right? So very few people on the plan, if you look at the stats, meet their deductible each year. Uh -huh. So you should also know that. And so we've got this high premium that, that keeps going up and up and up, right? So that's what you pay before you even think about healthcare. Before right. you even, and then we got this deductible in place. So I, we see, I mean, average in Wisconsin, I think Wisconsin's one of the the worst states, top five or bottom five, but uh, th let's say three to six thousand. I've seen seven, ten, fifteen thousand dollar deductibles. But yeah, this notion that you don't have to use your card, your insurance, and that you can actually get imaging and maybe even a surgery cheaper than what your deductible would have been, and uh -huh. that's that's nuts, right? So that's just shopping wisely. We can get the $600 MRI instead of the $6,000 MRI. Well, you just exhausted your deductible, but you actually spend less avoiding your insurance. And it's all under the guise of the network. I think the network is the biggest trick ever right. not for anything else. And the whole, the whole idea, the whole premise uh, or the assumption, and it's really a myth that because you have a network, you've got way better negotiated prices. And that's an absolute, that's an absolute myth. They're mm -hmm. five to 10 times higher than the cash price. So so when we erase that myth, then we just start shopping and we can actually pay out of pocket and, of course, not use the expensive insurance that we're paying for. But just right. these tricks of the industry, right? But so you bring up a great point. Do you even need insurance? Because I'm going to give you a really good deal and I'm going to take care of you. you right. Know? They've been touting the idea, okay, you know, use our network. It will reduce prices, uh, reduce costs. Yet their premiums, like you said, keep going up. The deductible, the threshold before they actually pay, uh, that they that that keeps going up. So, you know, Marty McCary, uh, Dr. Marty McCary, uh, who's speaking at your conference, which is fantastic, but who at the FMMA conference, I quote him now in a slide that I use, you know, these networks, uh, this idea of networks, it's like an insurance is as the middleman between the patient and the doctor, they are the arsonist and the fireman at the same time. They're playing both sides. Um, and I think what has helped me with regards to explaining this to my patient base is putting it in that perspective. You know, the bad guy here, and I don't like to say bad guy, good guy thing, but you know, the bad guy here, it's not, it's not you, it's not the patient, and it's not the doctor. So we both got had and the house like in a casino is always going to win. And so um, that's, uh, I, I try to always kind of shift the the focus to get back to what needs to happen. It's doctor patient. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, the tricks are, and that's when we start to dig in, we see them, this build, uh, like you said, the, the, the arsonist and the firefighter with the, I've heard the phrase, they build a bigger wall and then they want to sell you the, another ladder. And, right. Uh, 
you know, so they're creating the problems and then they're, of course, have the solution that always gets into your pocketbook. You had, you had touched on, uh, I'd like to touch on the, the topic of patient load. Uh, we see, we see, for instance, in DPCs that maybe they're around 2000, it varies sometimes 2,500 where they're seeing, like you said, I, I guess I wasn't aware that was happening on the specialty side. I use this, I'm a car guy, so I restore 40s, Chevys, um, as time allows, but you know, uh, people would say, for, for instance, we have a shortage of doctors, especially primary care, but really we have a shortage of doctors. And I, and I would, I come back and say, I don't, maybe because we're, we're certainly making it undesirable. So we have to, we have to, this is be going to become a problem if not already. However, if you give, if you give a doctor 26, as you mentioned, 26 to 30 patients a day, you're, you're, handcuffing that doctor's ability to get to root cause and treatment plans. I'd say in, in the car world, if anybody can relate to this, imagine if you said to a mechanic, I'm giving you a car, here's the line, every 15 minutes, that's all you get. Right. You're, there's a timer, go. How many actual problems would be solved and how many would just be duct taped and right and just, they okay, you got you back on the road. This isn't really fixed, but I got you back on the road. Right. And I think that's what's forcing these doctors, and you you probably lived it, right? So yeah. just of your your thoughts on that. And we, when we get to talk about root cause, and right, the goal is to make it go away, right? And right. Not just treat it the rest of your life. And, exactly. It, you know. Again, con the conditioning of the way yeah. that you do that. I, I use an example many times uh, in my field. I have kids come in with problems on both their feet, and ingrown. Let's use an ingrown toenail on both their feet. Um, one of the major carriers, um, because, you know, you, you have to be financially, um, financially responsible to the, to the patient. So we always would look up, um, whether or not the procedure would be covered to remove the ingrown toenail, but I could only do one, even though they had two, you know, they got two feet. Bro. I'm not going to do that to my, I, if that was a mom, I, I'd be upset, you know? So I, you know, you swallow that. So then as a business owner, I'm losing money on that, on that, on that, but the money's not the issue. It's the care of, to that patient. You're not doing that. So let me, um, like, let me clarify real quick. You said, so they've got an, 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 hypothetically an ingrown toenail on both feet probably happens in real life a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But insurance will only cover one today or one all One today. I one have today. to have them come so back for, come back. Okay. I have to have them come back for another day to get the other one yeah. done. Okay. And what's even, what's even what a lot of people don't realize, and this is how, They've they've changed the way even the reimbursement this is a little a little thing in here. So I do the case, I see the patient, I take care of one ingrown toenail. The doctor, I took care of both all the time, but there are doctors out there that would have them come back the next day. You cannot charge to evaluate that again because it's not like you just do the procedure blindly without looking to make sure that the toe is stable to do that again. They don't even pay, they don't reimburse the doctor for thinking to reevaluate the condition. Um, they're more driven towards that procedure to get done. So you're not really, and then the time element of it, it's not, you don't have enough time between because you're quickly going through these uh, patients because you can't make ends meet at the end because they have cut your reimbursements. And so, I mean, that's a whole nother conversation because we talk about reimbursements on there but it's just a bad system um overall but yeah, it, it, yeah in the specialty world there's such if you ask you know the average for specialists to be seen uh when you're referred over there in in the networks it's four to six months you know before you can see them i deal with diabetics who have open wounds you know you cannot wait one day <laughs> with a lot of those It'll be, um, an ER. It'll be an ER, urgent care. Yeah, exactly. And then you're overloading that system, which really right. should be for acute care. Right. So it's, it's all, it's all messed up right now. <laughs> so if we can, yeah, if we can break this down a second, I guess, what is the, uh, probably money, but I guess, how does, how do, how does this look for insurance? Why, why would they require uh, coming back one that's missing time from school or work and everything else, but coming back the next day and then you have follow-ups potentially, but what are they, what does insurance gain from separating those two visits? Is it just that they can bill a lot more or what? They can bill a lot, but you can do more, more, more procedures. Because then, you could, I'm just yeah. envisioning a, a one visit and then you could say, well, but it would be 
combined. I, power. I can't, I can't understand it. I'll use, let me give you another example of it. So I dealing with a lot of diabetics and since my patient base tends to be one that I follow up regularly, when mm. someone got, gets injured and they have an open wound, I know as a surgeon that that needs to be cleaned out. I can do that outpatient. I just need to delineate whether or not how much do I need to remove. And one of the ways that we do that is check with an MRI. That way we can see soft tissue and, and bone involvement and how much needs to be done. I wanted to get this done outpatient. Patient came in, saw me, I saw the wound. I sent to get a, an approval. This is when we were still with insurance. Sent to get an approval for this MRI so I can do this case outpatient within the week. Um, the, um, the insurance company, when they were trying to get authorization, said, no, you need to start with, um, you need to do an x-ray. So that's another a cost. You need to do local wound care on it, um, which they said at least four weeks. Again, open wound that we're dealing with already. Uh, I, Sorry. you play the system. And this is where you get conditioned to play the system as a doctor that's working in that system. Mm -hmm. All right, how am I going to get this patient taken care of? I call my buddy up in the emergency room, send them over there to the emergency room. They run it through as an emergency because it's an open wound. And um, they do the MRI at the hospital. Again, higher cost. <laughs> they do the um, admission in there. I do the case, all right? But we're always talking about costs for the, for the patient costs um, on, a, on a money component of it. And then, you know, reimbursement losses on a money component. It's time also. People forget about time um, and time off work, time to, to go over there. You know, that was extra time for me to go to the hospital to do all that. Um, delayed time for the patient to get better. Um, it's like if you were trying to waste time, that's what you'd do. Yeah, yeah. It's like I, I, the opposite of lean, if you will, right? It's just exactly every exactly. step is value added. And it's actually, if I was trying to design the system that would waste the most amount of time, I would do exactly that. It would that. be that system. Yeah. And, and so you're asking about yeah. how, how it doesn't make sense. I That's the whole thing. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> so, so. How, how frustrating. And I want to, we can open it up for questions here as well. And I've, um, got kind of a closing question as we go, as we move toward our, our hour. Uh, but how frustrating that must be for a, a trained physician to be taking these orders and all these wasteful requests for pre os and everything else from non-medical people mm -hmm. who are following Many some times. book and don't even understand the medical needs. How frustrating. And I think that's probably one of the causes of the doctors feeling the way they do today. One of many, but... right got to be a big one is like who you're, you're questioning what it I just went to school for what like 25 years it feels like you know like if you include every year of including Ele ele 11 years so you have undergrad <laughs> yeah. grad in, in residency yeah a local doctor had ended up I think it was like 25 to 28 if you yeah depending upon when you look grade at grade school and everything it's like uh -huh. okay uh but yeah 10 11 years of just medical stuff and here's this person behind a keyboard following a book that, you know, just, that's gotta be, I don't know if I'd be able to handle that. <laughs> there, there's so much, I mean, I probably could write a book about all the insane things. One of yeah. the the funny ones that I used to get back as a, on a, in an explanation of benefits was that they would put bad diagnosis. So oh. think about that. I mean, that's what was the, that's why they didn't pay for mm. a particular procedure that I did, they put mm. bad diagnosis as if they saw the patient, but also it makes no sense. It's like an oxymoron. How can it be a bad diagnosis? A diagnosis is what the doctor assesses and claims to be the issue of their, how can that be bad when, when it's, it's a real thing? Or not there's, even no, there's no good or bad to it. <laughs> yeah. That's like, might as well just slap you in the face. I mean, on right. that one. my goodness. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so uh, any questions, uh, you guys can type them in if you like. We'll see. If, uh, usually we cover it so well, of course, there probably won't be any, but <laughs> we were kind of um, all over all over the place there. But you know, yeah. I, I my big thing also is I really recommend as much as possible, just every it's 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 going to take a, the, the change into a free market healthcare ecosystem. It's going, it needed to happen in the doctor community first because they're the ones that are the ones, DPC particularly, they're the ones that 
are rendering healthcare. Um, and as we work with buyers and sellers, you know, the, the, the buyers of healthcare need to be as educated about what's going on also the behind the scenes of what's frustrating. And we have to work collectively and, and, and it's a symbiotic, symbiotic kind of relationship work together. Um, because in the end, every doctor is going to be part of that community too, as I start getting all those services also. So, um, as a, a small business owner, and I reach out to any anyone um, looking at as as an employer uh, offering DPC to your your employee base, you have a healthier work group in your own in your own practice or in your own business. Um, you're not worried about time off because they've got somebody that's that's watching them regularly, and it encourages them to stay healthy. It's very proactive rather than being reactive, which is, I think, one of the big things that you were, you know, we were talking about before. Why it is so the network is really with limited time. It's very just reactive, reactive, reactive. You cannot get down to root cause. Right, right. Yeah, no, great information and and great to hear from a seasoned physician, right, who's lived it, who succeeded at living it, and I, I want to maybe. Maybe we can close with this kind of big question. And um, I didn't, I was looking if I had a copy of your book, Andy, but I'll put one in the uh, the video. I'll plug it up there as a picture. Thank so you. See it because it's a wonderful book. And if, if um, you're a physician considering this, you should check it out or even others. It gives you that medical perspective you didn't have. But what advice? So we had talked about residents. Uh, we had talked about, um, you know, new doctors and experienced doctors. But what advice would you give to them because I have, uh, I think in this recording, especially, I don't see any MDs on, uh, but this could be very valuable. What advice would you give to them who they're, um, who are considering maybe they're unhappy in what they're, or they're hearing all these things and like, I don't need to jump into this mud. Um, what would you tell them? You don't have to jump into anything full on. Um, and I think that's what many times we're, we're as, as the way that we, we've been trained, we want to always go to the the pinnacle of of the treatment um and if you're looking at your practice as the patient you have to piecemeal it you can't do it all at one go definitely um reach out to uh someone doing it already um find a good mentor that is already in direct care and there's so many just in the last 10 years we've had a huge surge in both dpc and at the conference at the DPC summit that I missed, direct specialty care had their own booth there and they were doing phenomenally uh, as far as uh, it, inviting doctors to come in and talk to them. Uh, a lot of specialists were at that. And just reach out, the, the, the information is more available now than ever than it ever was. Um, when I used to teach in the medical school, um, Students would always get worried about um, passing a test in order to get to the next, just like because you were conditioned to do that when you were in college, um, to pass the test. And I said, you know what? Don't worry about that. We want you to do well. You do have to pass the test, but we'll help you get there. The most important test that you have is when that patient walks in and says, Doc, this hurts. That's the test that you have to pass, okay? Mm -hmm. But you don't do it on the first day. You get help to do that along the way. You learn from that. You work with that individual also. And just like you're working with your practice and working with your patient base right now, you work with them and talk it through with them. They will tell you what they need. And when it comes to business, small businesses are always going to be, you're fulfilling, you find a problem and you're fulfilling that need for that problem. And when you do that one-on-one -on -one with your patient, it, it you don't have to think about like multiple steps, just start slow and start simple and just talk, talk to them. It, when I was in, I'm just gonna add this, when I was in New York, I was very blessed that, um, I don't know how this happened, but I my book won the Independent Press Award, which apparently is an international award which I did not realize because really I've sold internationally <laughs> according to stats. Hmm. Um, I, there was not a doctor at that. Well, there were doctors that were authors and doing other things, but the majority of the people that I talked to over there were just 
regular folks. They weren't doctors. But when I explained what the premise of my book was, everybody understood it. Mm -hmm. There wasn't anyone that said, oh, yeah, no, I don't think there's anything wrong with the healthcare system. Everybody right. had a comment about the healthcare delivery and um, explaining them that healthcare and health insurance, having that conversation, I think we educated a lot of people there, but the book resonated with not just doctors. The reason why it won, it resonated with the regular folks also. And mm -hmm. my patients, I was seeing that in my own practice, but that solidified it for me. Um, there's a section in the big, in the book and I, that, um, is about the history of how we got tangled into it. And it's not just the doctors that were conditioned to conform, everybody got conditioned to conform to this. So um, I think it's just getting the word out there. And um, yeah. Yeah, they say that common sense isn't maybe so common anymore. And, and I think, you know, <laughs> what I have the same reaction when we talk about free market healthcare, it's so intuitive. It's like the way we do everything else. And we uh -huh. start to juxtapose healthcare next to these other industries. And why is it different? We're just purchasing healthcare services, really, right. All, right? I mean, it's not to say it's not complicated. Healthcare is complicated, but so is everything. So is a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, I used to work in auto manufacturing. There's about 30,000 parts in a car, and they all have to come together exactly the right second. Right. Right right. So we could say that about a lot of industries, but somehow automakers managed to do it really well. And so I think as we start to ask those hard questions, um, Grace, and I can provide some resources as well, but if, if people would like to reach out to you, what is the best way to reach you? I'm, um, I'm on social media. Uh, you, if you just look up at Dr. Grace DPM, um, usually you'll find me on, on, uh, LinkedIn, on Instagram, on X. Um, I, I do quite a, a few, um, I'm invited to podcasts and webinars like this. Mm -hmm. Um, but and my book is out there on Amazon and, and in the bookstores also. So um, I'm pretty accessible with regards to that. Well, congratulations on your success and your heart for. I appreciate for your support also. Yeah. <laughs> with yeah. <all> that. <laughs> you bet. It's been certainly great to get to know you. And so and you can reach out to me as well. Matt at selffundhealth.com. Also on LinkedIn. Uh, but uh, the DPC, uh, I think it's called DPC Alliance through Shane Purcell and, and others. Yeah, leaders. DPC Alliance, um, mm. uh, direct specialty care with Diana Granita and uh, Dr. Uh, Laura K Kenny. Um, got them in Dallas, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, Hardworking folks, um, doctor, doctor um, Laura's a doctor, I know. And is Diana a doctor? Di she's a rheumatologist. A rheumatologist mm -hmm. as well, yeah. yeah. So they're both yeah. on DPC. Yeah. And, um, and both the market medical association like out of their own pocket. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. The, the FMMA, the free market medical association, um, so many resources there, mm -hmm. the Benjamin rush Institute mm -hmm. for anyone that is a medical student, um, or a resident or has someone that's thinking about going into medicine. That's a fantastic organization. Um, Dr. Kathleen Brown, who is a direct specialist and her husband, Jack are running uh, the show there. Um, so there's a lot of, there are a lot of us out here that want to educate. There are a lot of us that believe in what we're doing because we just, it's a calling for us that we, you know, get back to autonomy for the doctor, autonomy for the patient. And I think when it comes down to it, it's free will and choices for individuals. Um, and we can go off on that as, yeah. as we, you know. And that's, and that's exactly what we promote in FMMA, right? We're not really against anyone. We are against, you know, monopolies and that con concepts, but we're really not against anyone. What we're trying to do is just offer better alternatives and shopping for value, just like we do in every other industry. And Actually, so, it, it's a, it's a, not an either or it's a both yeah. and. Yeah. <laughs> And this movement, I know in Wisconsin, we had 15 DPCs, for instance, in 2020. We have 124 today. Wow. And the DSC explosion is happening as well. I was just at a, a new surgery and infusion center this week, grand opening, and so uh, all over the place. So um, uh, if you would like to reach out to us, certainly feel free. And uh, we both of us are glad to help you. Anything else, Grace, before we close? The only thing is always ask, what's the cash price? I think if we have to, if there's anything that comes out of our discussion here, one little pearl to start doing, even if you have insurance, ask before they run it, ask what the cash price is so you have a comparison. 
you would do that anywhere else when you're buying services. That's right. Think out of the box. You might be able to get four of those cash prices for your one deductible, and that's what you need for. But that's yeah. how much you could save. Yeah, so excellent point. So thanks again, Grace. Certainly keep in touch. I'm sure I'll see you at a conference soon. We tend to run into each other. Absolutely. So, yeah. Have a great uh, have a great week and keep your head up and keep going. Thank you. Thanks for what you're doing, Matt. You bet. Likewise. Thank you. <laughs>